It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any. Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a monster Monday with my guy, Andrew Brandt. So much to discuss with the latest on Deshaun Watson and the Broncos sale and the Rams contracts. I had to get the host of the Business of Sports podcast back on ASAP. We are presented, of course, by DraftKings. Love those dudes. Just like we love all of you that just do one little extra thing each week to help us. One little thing. And you get rewarded for it. You can spread the word via social media. At Ross Tucker NFL. At Ross Tucker Pod. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Or even TikTok. Or you can just send me an example of you giving us a five-star review, which is amazing and works. Sponsor confirmation emails. Take advantage of any of the great sponsors that you hear of, like Express Clothing, LinkedIn, Ufos, of course, Simply Safe. Take advantage of any of those. And then the YouTube shout out's really cool. Subscribe to the YouTube page so you can see the highlight clips of the other shows that maybe you don't listen to. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. And then you get a shout out. I did a couple of those shout out videos over the weekend that were really cool. It's Big Show time. The Big Show. Boy, Andrew, uh, the first week of June, or maybe it was the second week of June, pretty busy time for the business of sports. I feel like we took a week off or two weeks off from you coming here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Obviously, everybody subscribes to the Sunday 7. They get your Sunday newsletter. That was jam-packed yesterday. I read it, as I always do. And I know you talked about some of these topics last week on the Business of Sports podcast, but, man, it's a busy time for you. Yeah, it certainly is, Ross. There's so much going on in the business of sports right now. Deshaun and the Rams, with their continued largesse and spending – it's like it never really stops, you know, as uh, as the OTAs, OTAs go on in mini camps and not really much going on on the field. That's when the off the field stuff happens. I mean, I don't know where you want to start. We've got a, an incredible uh, record price for ownership of a new friend of an existing franchise. We've got Deshaun, wherever you want to go. First of all, I want to go wherever you are, where you got the <laughs> birds chirping, you got the dogs playing. You're you're at a good wherever you are right now, Andrew. You're at a nice spot. You're you're with one with nature right now. Well, I'll tell you, there's a lot going on in sports in my world, but that's not going to stop me from from like nature and getting out and uh, enjoying this time of year. As you know, I am a professor for the semester times a year, so when the semester ends, I get away. So I'm in nature. Hope you hear me all right and. Hope these dogs quiet down, but I'll start because it's it's we almost kind of uh, take for granted what just happened in Denver, Ross, because people sort of threw out even even a p- potential five billion dollar number. I mean, we just saw a franchise sell for four point six five billion dollars. Think about it. Like the highest sale price before that was the Carolina Panthers at two two seven five. This has doubled it in three, four years. 2018 was the Panthers sale. And that's just astounding to me that in four years we could double the franchise price. And the Broncos were, you know, pretty well-known franchise, but probably not top 10. You know, when you talk about 10 franchises that would be more valuable, they're probably in that 10 to 15 range. So what a massive, massive sale and every owner in the NFL has got to be grinning ear to ear because their asset values are skyrocketing and the pace of player salaries is nothing close to that. So they're making a lot of money. Yeah. I did see one report where Josh Harris, who owns the Sixers and the devils reportedly would have offered $5 billion if he had been given an assurance that 
they would not allow Rob Walton to beat it. The the guy that ended up winning. Yeah. I, can you explain that to me? I was a little bit confused as to what if you thought it was worth five billion, why didn't you offer five billion? I mean, if if Walton ends up paying more than that, then he pays more than that. I found that a little hard to understand too, because it is an auction. It is a bidding process. If these bidders were vetted, Josh Harris and Rob Walton and other ones were already vetted. <clears throat> why wouldn't you just go for the highest number? And that's why I handicapped that Walton would be the guy. Because like David Tepper three years ago, Ross, the owners like, everyone's got big money. The owners like big, big money. Or someone who can actually, quote unquote, write the check. So can they write the check? Now, I don't know if Rob Walton's writing a $4.65 billion check, but he can get closer to the initial check than all the other guys. And that's what David Tepper, I think I told you this, I said it on my podcast, I was told by a reliable source, when the Panthers were sold, that price, other bidders were up towards 2.5. But Tepper could write the check for 227. So again, they did not necessarily take the high bidder. And maybe that's true in this case, too, where Walton could, quote unquote, write the check, someone worth $60 billion. And here we are. You know who the top two wealthiest owners in the NFL are? Walton and Tepper, the two most recent owners. That shows you where these franchise values are going. You need to be big time billionaire to get into this process. And just a side note, Ross, the first and third wealthiest owners are from the same family. Rob Walton is brother-in-law to Stan Kroenke, the owner of the Rams. So we now have the first and third wealthiest owners in the NFL from the same family. While we're on it, Andrew, uh, I, I guess it's related, but Dean Spanos, the owner of the Chargers, he's being sued by his sister who, I don't know if she just wants him to sell or what's going on. But I kind of feel like these are kind of related on some level, right? Yeah, I mean, families have squabbles about a lot of things. Very few of them get public. But when you own an NFL team, it gets public, right? So we saw this a few years ago in Tennessee where Amy Strunk came out sort of the winner in that battle amongst their family for being the face of the Tennessee Titans, Amy Strunk Adams. And it's happening in... I was going to say San Diego. It's happening in Los Angeles. Dean Spanis, longtime owner of the franchise, but this is family owned. There's a trust. There's other brothers and sisters involved. And this is what happens. So his sister is coming out accusing him of not only mismanagement, but misogyny in management, which is something I really haven't seen in kind of a legal battle for a, for a franchise or even for a business where there's misogyny attached to this. And of course, the Spanos. Alec, uh, Dean Spanos came out and said, this is frivolous, and here we go. So some of these fights get resolved publicly, some privately. We had the same fights. I, we were just talking about the Broncos. The Broncos had the same fights where a judge said, you know what? No one's getting it. It's going to be sold in a trust, and that's what just happened. Let's stay in Los Angeles, Andrew, because everybody was talking last week about the Rams. They give Aaron Donald, who had three years left on his contract, a new record-setting contract. Then they give Cooper Cup, who had two years left on his contract, a huge raise as well. Your thoughts? I've been talking about this a lot in media last week and Pat McAfee's show. I think the important thing people need to know about spending in the NFL is this. Cash is not cap. And that's what people get confused sometimes when they say, oh, this dead cap money, they got to pay this guy. No, they don't have to pay him. It's just cap. So cash is cash. People know what cash is. Cap is accounting. So what the Rams are continually doing is loading cash in the first year and limiting cap. How do you do that? You load cash in a signing bonus, which is prorated for cap, for cap purposes. Then you keep small cash in the first year. Example, Matthew Stafford, 60 million bonus, prorated over five years, 
12 million a year, salary of 1.5, cap number of 13.5, cash number 61.5. So I point out this example. For one player on the Rams, there's $48 million cash over cap. That's how you spend over the cap, but stay under the cap. My other point on this, which is not taken seriously enough by, by media and fans, is that the Rams are only able to do this because they draft well. And people say, well, they don't have any draft picks. Well, they have low round picks and they hit on them. The guy that I used to work with when I worked with Gary Vaynerchuk is Jordan Fuller, their starting safety. When you have elite contracts like Adams, like Stafford, I'm sorry, like Donald, like Stafford, like Cup, you have to balance them with at least half your roster on rookie deals. That's what they do. So the Rams are doing two things, heavily using cash over cap and really supplementing a big chunk of their roster with low paid players. Well, and also, Andrew, let's be clear about this. It's going to come to roost at some point. I mean, there, there's going to be a reckoning. Everybody's like, well, how do they do it? Well, there will come a time where there will be a bunch of dead money that they're going to have to absorb. But their hope is that that's further down the line when the cap's way higher and that people really won't notice it that much. Correct. And kudos to the Rams for winning a Super Bowl in a year they had, I think, the third highest dead cap charge in the history of football, Jared Goff. Jared Goff counted $21 million on their cap last year while they're winning the Super Bowl. And again, that $21 million was not cash. That was accounting. Goff already got the cash. But think about last year. They were paying Stafford $20 million. They were counting Goff $21 million, and they win the Super Bowl. So, yes, it's, and you better be right when you do deals like this. Obviously, they were wrong on Goff. You better be right when you do deals like this. Any thoughts in particular, Andrew, on the precedent they're setting? We talk, you talk all the time about precedent. And I think it's funny because I think the precedent, you know, people don't like to redo deals with three and two years left. They don't like to just basically do a totally new deal without adding any extra years, Aaron Donald. I think the precedent is, if you're the best defensive player in the NFL and you're the offensive player of the year, they're going to give you your money and they don't really care. Yeah, I know. So we heard Donald three weeks ago on a pod, right, saying I'm at peace if I don't play again. <laughs> but then he said it's not the money, which told me, you know what I'm going to say. It was all about the money. And I don't know the backstory, Ross, but would he have retired if they didn't do his deal? I don't know. But they did it. They'll never have to answer that question. And he's being paid like a quarterback. He's getting 100 over three, which is wow. You know, 100 over three, which is 33 a year, which is good quarterback pay money. And then I said at the time before Donald, I'm saying the real guy they got to address is Cup, not Donald. Because Cup at 15 a year is making 10 million a year less than Tyreek Hill, Devontae Adams, A.J. Brown. And they got that rectified too. So, yeah, I mean, they're doing what they got to do, uh, but they can, yeah, they can, they're going to have, I don't know who else would be Ross, because I don't know who else would come to him and say, Hey, what about me? They'll have to face that down the road. Last, but certainly not least this Deshaun Watson situation, Andrew, isn't going away anytime soon. There's more lawsuits. There's more information coming out. His lawyers saying things that don't seem to really be helping him. It, it's a mess, and it continues. It feels like it's getting messier. Well, I think the whole thing is, what are the Browns thinking? Because um, you know what they want to say, but they can't say, right? You and I have talked about this. They want to say, hey, you can never get a guy like this, right? Never. Never would a Deshaun Watson be on the market, ever. But he is. And we went out, and we got him. And everyone knows Deshaun Watson's a Southern kid and New Orleans and Atlanta and Carolina were in it. And then Cleveland was out of it. How'd Cleveland get back into it? They gave him a contract that looks to me like his agent wrote. Full guarantees. Uh, bad behavior is prevented from suspension forfeiture. 
I mean, he only if he misses the whole year, he only loses a million of 46 million this year. So anyway, people are thinking, wow, the Browns, they may want to revisit this. I just want to say here, the Browns are not revisiting this, right? The Browns are all in. They're all in. And yes, these dribs and drabs from New York Times are going to come out, but they've got a Brennan Barrett because this is their guy. Now, we'll see what the suspension is, but it's clear to me now, Ross, this is clearly a long-term play. So they paid two thirty million over five. What they really looked at was we're probably playing two hundred thirty million over four, and then think about that average. That's massive, because they probably won't get him much this year, if at all. So they just looked at this as a long term play. He's twenty, whatever he is, and he's going to have those four years after that. And wow, what a commitment they made to this guy. So. I mean, let's talk about the discipline quick, Andrew, because I feel like this is why the NFL waits and waits and waits Mm -hmm. because they don't want to issue the discipline and then have a lot more information come out after, right? Well, this was Ray Rice, right? (laughs) The two games and then the video came out. I don't think we're expecting a video with Deshaun Watson, but you're right. They waited, but people are asking me, well, can they just – wait until 2023 because there's more that's going to come out. I don't think they're going to wait anymore. You know, I think July we're going to have a decision. And, you know, with Trevor Bauer getting two years in the Major League Baseball, I don't know what you think. I I just don't see this guy getting on the field this year. With the the NFL's attitude towards attracting to women, I just don't see it. I don't see him playing this year. Wow. That would put the Browns in a very, very interesting spot for the rest of this season. That's for sure. Andrew, fantastic stuff as always. You got to check him out on social media at Andrew Brandt. Make sure you subscribe to the Business of Sports podcast. We don't talk to Andrew every week here on the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, but you still need your business fill. So make sure you're checking him out in Business of Sports. And then you can get the updates as well with the Sunday 7 newsletter, which is awesome. I look forward to it every week. Perfect thing to read on a Sunday, by the way. Andrew, thank you so much as always. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Ross. Thank you also to Simply Safe. You know, I think you guys could probably tell last week that I was away. We were at the beach with my wife's family. And we do it every year. You know what I will tell you? It is so nice to come back from a week away like that and have no concerns about your house at all. I mean, you guys check me out on Instagram and social media. You knew I wasn't home. Am I concerned about someone going to our house? No, because of Simply Safe, because of the monitoring plans that are affordably priced at a dollar a day with no long term contract or hidden fees. Because it's the security system named Best Home Security of 2022 by U.S. News World Report a third year in a row. I know that nobody is in our house or able to go in our house. That's the beauty of having a security system like Simply Safe. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash tucker. Go today and you can claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash Tucker. Tuck's Takes. Hi, Ross. Good morning. Let's start with uh, former Broncos. How about Cowboys? Former Cowboys head coach Jason Garrett. He will be the guy replacing Drew Brees on Sunday Night Football. Right. Um, I guess my takeaway there is the same one I have with most guys when they're getting into broadcasting, which is no idea. Um, You know, Jason's a fellow Princeton football guy. I know him. I like him. We'll see. You know, he might be very good. He might be awful. He might be very dull and boring. I'm just not a big believer in preconceived notions or judgments. Let's see how he is. 
You know, let's see how we like them. It, it's a subjective industry, by the way. So some of you might like them. Some of you might not. But let's give him a chance. I have not checked him out on the USFL games to really comment there. So I don't know how he is, you know, calling games, but we'll see what he's like, you know, in the studio. Tux takes. As you and Andrew already discussed, Chargers owner Dean Spanos being sued by his sister for control of the Chargers. So here's how I feel about this. This really bothers me because life is short. You only go around one time. It's not worth it. They've all got plenty of money. To have fighting within the family really, really bothers me. I don't like animosity within families. I know it happens a lot. I would encourage all of you, if you have any issue within your family, do what you can on your end to try to make amends. You can't control how the other person behaves, but you can you can forgive and forget on your end because it's just not worth it. You know, relationships, family, love, so much more important than money, especially for these people that have so much. Tux takes. Jack Del Rio fined $100,000 by head coach Ron Rivera uh, after his comments last week, and he goes ahead and deletes his Twitter account as well. What a mess, right? You know, I think there's a lot of lessons there for a lot of us about when in doubt, don't tweet it out, as well as talking about subjects that are highly controversial, highly polarizing. I just, look, That's there's a big reason why I never tweet about that stuff. And I never comment about I talked to about talked to you guys about it last week, but I never tweet about it, never comment on it. I don't see the upside. I don't see how my family benefits. Me, my wife, my daughters, I, I don't see how we benefit from that. Now, look, there's a whole other argument to be made. There are people that are purposefully polarizing, and as a result, they are able to have success because they just placate the people on one side or the other. Um, and that's how they make their living. But again, they're probably placating people rather than always saying what they necessarily really think. Tux takes. Speaking about tweeting or deleting tweets, how about Panthers wide receiver Robbie Anderson? He tweets about the possibility of retirement and then deletes it. Not good. Not good on so many levels. I, I I have no idea what some of these guys are thinking when they say and do some of the things that they do. But now that gets the antenna up of the Panthers a little bit, right? I mean, why would you want – I mean, maybe he's just being honest. Maybe he's really just thinking about it. But I'm looking at Robbie's contract – and you're talking about a guy who has three years left on his contract? I mean, you don't want to have to give back some – or two years left on his contract. He doesn't want to have to give back some of that money by retiring. You know, he's not going to do that. And by the way, he's scheduled to make a lot of money. I don't know. I, I That is not a smart thing to do. That's for sure. Tux takes. And finally, Dolphins wide receiver Tyreek Hill talks about the frustrations he had with the Kansas City Chiefs, and that led to his trade. I tweeted over the weekend about this, Bry, at Ross Tucker NFL. This would scare me to death if I were a Dolphins fan. So the guy that played for the team that went to the AFC Championship game four straight years, two Super Bowls, won one, had Patrick Mahomes as his quarterback, Andy Reid as his head coach, 
led the team in targets and was seventh in the NFL in targets, wasn't happy? What? But now he's going to be happy after he just signed the bleep you contract in Miami and can basically do whatever he wants. And he's got a first year head coach and Tua as his quarterback. To that, I say good luck to you, Miami Dolphins, because that does not seem like a recipe for success at all. Not at all. Um, you know what is a recipe for success? Getting food. Actually, let me take that back. You know what is a recipe for success, Bri? Getting clothes from Express. I love how comfortable their clothes are. It's so important. It's so breathable, lightweight. It's my go-to destination for summer style. I just ordered two more shirts, another pair of shorts. I need going out clothes that I like for the summer. Boom. It's all about Express. Find something for every destination at Express online or in store. Let's do an email, Bright. Ever wanted to ask an NFL player a question? Well, here's, here's your, your chance. chance. It's time to ask Ross. Email address, ross at rostucker.com. Cannot tell you how much I love your email questions. Please keep sending them in. And if you take advantage of any of our sponsors, Simply Safe, UFOS, LinkedIn, whatever, I guarantee to read and respond to your question ASAP. What do you got, Brian? From Mike, who says, Ross, my question, as I watched the back half of the draft, I was wondering what teams are thinking when they make their picks. Are they taking more long shot swings than in the early rounds since they cannot fill all the picks on the roster? The talent does not fit the need. Do you pass? Good question, Mike. And the answer is different teams have different philosophies. Some of the teams just want to get guys that they think are going to be solid special teams players who might have a chance to start at some point if they develop, but that they feel confident will be able to be good backups and good special teamers for cheap. Other teams like to roll the dice. Other teams will take small school guys or guys with outstanding physical traits that haven't put it together and hope that maybe they hit on one of these guys. So different teams have different philosophies with their late round picks. Some just continue to follow the board and go with the next best player available and, and hope that he pans out. But those are sort of the different philosophies that teams can have. Good question. Really good question. Speaking of good, ooh, how about Pizza Boy Brewing? How about Sportaculture? HumanHeadNYC.com, SteakhouseSports.com, Go-Bangles.com, Evergreen Economics, and by far the greatest Father's Day gift of all time, MyFrontPageStory.com. Get one for your dad today. He will not regret it. Other than that, really enjoyed going over the NFC East draft picks with Jimmy Kemsky on today's College Draft Podcast. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feast, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found.